So to begin, our first session of the day here in the new Ingredients Theatre is Old Ingredient, New Science, EPA and DHA, Omega-3s and Emerging Health Outcomes. And that's going to be presented by Caitlin Roke, who is the Director of Scientific Communication and Outreach at GOED. So Caitlin's doctoral research actually focused on omega-3s, so you're in very safe hands for this session. Um, now, over to Caitlin, who's going to tell us a bit more about herself and EPA and DHA. Hi, everyone. OK, here we go. Thank you for those people who are here in person today and those who are joining us virtually online. Really excited to be here sharing some information about EPA and DHA. And as the title suggests, EPA and DHA have been around for quite a long time, so not a new ingredient like you might expect. So we've titled it Old Ingredient, New Science. So we're really excited to share some of the new and emerging science regarding EPA and DHA omega-3s. OK, so there is so much existing ongoing and emerging science on the topic of EPA and DHA omega-3s. We are so lucky that this is one, or these are two of the most well-studied nutrients out of all the nutrients that we see um, at shows like this or in the scientific literature. So with that benefit of an excessive amount of science also comes a challenge because it is very difficult to summarize and analyze and understand this huge body of evidence. So despite having a vast amount of extensive research to date, we know that most people are not consuming enough EPA and DHA. <clears throat> so no matter <clears throat> excuse me, how much science we introduce, we're still not having a lot of intake in the diet. So it's really important to us and to the people that we work with to try and introduce new ingredients, um, new supplements, and consider food options to encourage increased <clears throat> intake of EPA and DHA. Excuse me. So I just added this emoji here because, as I said, lots of science, a bit overwhelming, really exciting to be able to have this much to work with as we consider the topic to date. Okay, so just wanted to <clears throat> overview what to expect from our presentation today. So we are going to introduce our new database. So the GoEd Clinical Study Database just launched in February. So it's a brand new tool that we're excited to share with the group today. Thank you. We're going to talk about some of the complexities of EPA and DHA as a nutritional science topic, especially from the field of mental and cognitive health. We know that's such an important topic for all of us today and in the field. We're going to briefly share a few um, interesting points about EPA versus DHA as these nutrients are started to be pit against each other more often. And then talk about three emerging areas of science that we're watching in relation to um, EPA and DHA. Okay, so to introduce the GOED Clinical Study Database. This is the first database of its kind that really works like a sophisticated PubMed. And so it's going to bring you the science about EPA and DHA to your laptop, to your hands faster than ever before. So we're really excited about this as a tool for omegas, but we also think it has huge value as a platform for other nutrients. So all of us have our favorite nutrients, mine being EPA and DHA, maybe yours are probiotics or vitamin D. So this database can be used as a platform for those nutrients as well. So really exciting database potential in the future for other organizations and companies to consider. So why use the database? We all have access to the internet, we can doctor Google, we can find the answers ourselves. So what would be the benefit of using a database like this? And I think this image is one of my favorite as anyone who's tried to find an answer online or in the literature knows, it, uh, it feels like you have swarms of information surrounding you and it's quite overwhelming. And so what we wanted to do firstly was to save you time. So everyone is extremely busy. It's very hard to find the information. And so we want to be able to get the information to you faster than ever before and in an efficient way. So when we're looking online, it's also really difficult to compare study by study. So what does it look like across five different researchers on different health topics? 
So we've worked really hard on the data visualizations and the data summaries on our database to make it more effective and efficient to review the science for omega-3s. So that's what we're introducing with our database, it, a huge time saver as well as an efficient way to review the evidence. So really excited about this tool for our use and those who really also are invested in EPA and DHA science. So as we are in Geneva, Switzerland, I wanted to use this image uh, to our advantage to explain the database a little bit. So we think of the database kind of being like a Swiss army knife. So lots of different functionalities to it, not just one, um, one arm. So I'm just going to explain the kind of go in a clockwise motion around the graphic so that we can talk through some of these points. So one of the interesting benefits of this database would be to review data to help substantiate structure and function claims. Unfortunately, we can't do the claim application for you. We know those are hugely time extensive, but this would give you a start to gather the research that you would need to put your claim together. The next function would be to provide direction in product development. Sometimes it's hard to know where to go if we're going to be innovating a new ingredient or a new product, and this might help fine tune our, our efforts in that realm. Um, the corkscrew at the bottom to identify gaps in research and help support grant applications. So perhaps you're interested in a new field like sleep. You might want to know how much work has been done. What does the science say so far? This can help you get the evidence for a topic like that. Around the bottom, we have information gathering from marketing collateral. So we've been really excited to hear from our marketing colleagues as we kind of launched a scientific tool, but our marketing colleagues have been using this quite heavily to look at the work that they're doing in either to create materials or to support consumer education. The next one we have to prepare white papers and opinion articles. So if you're looking for resources on um, an article that you're writing to support some statements, this is a great way to use that. Documentation for presentations, going to a wide audience of healthcare practitioners or consumers. Um, another one that we thought was really important was to respond to and comment on media articles. So we were able to do this in the past, but sometimes it took weeks or even months to go through thoughtfully and come up with an answer to a media article. And that's extremely too slow for the very fast news cycle that we experience. So we want to know quite quickly how to respond to these media articles in an efficient way. And lastly, the one at the top, to save time in gathering literature and performing systematic reviews. So we have some exciting academic collaborations that we're undertaking to demonstrate how they can use the database in order to further their academic pursuits. So in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to just spend a minute to talk about how we've used the database to learn a little bit more about EPA and DHA in our brain. And I find it helpful when I start looking at a new health topic to take a look at the media. So although the media doesn't always reflect the science, it's an interesting way to get a sense of what the consumers are talking about and what they're interested in. So I just pulled a few headlines over the last year or so that talk about what people are thinking about from a consumer perspective in the media. And so this image here, just to represent how many topics there are in the field of brain and cognitive health. So I've only listed about 10 here. We know there's many, many more. But this is one reason it's very difficult to come to a consensus on cognitive health or brain health and how these supplements might help. There are so many different pathologies and etiologies of these conditions that make it quite unique. So we might have differential effects if we're looking at anxiety compared to depression. And so in, a, in order to have a blanket statement becomes quite difficult. So we might want to consider how these nutrients differ in these health outcomes. Also, maybe we have dosage considerations for each of these different um, conditions. My screen just went blank, just as a heads up down there. If, oh, perfect, thank you. And I just reset my timer, so we're all set. And for those of us in the audience who know the scientific research and are aware of the nutritional science field, it's extremely complicated. So that's not going to be 
something that uh, surprises us, but the three main things I wanted to highlight here was the heterogeneity that we see across scientific studies. So how different they are, making them extremely difficult to compare. So when we think about the participants in the studies, the subjects and the clients that we have in the clinical trials, they differ substantially in age, genetics, and health status. So it makes it quite hard if we have a study in infants looking at brain health and then a study in elderly looking at brain health, and we really can't compare those two groups together as an example. Um, the next point we want to talk about is the assessment. So if we think about a group of researchers and there's, let's say, five people trying to design their clinical trial, but all of them have their favorite test to use. They want to use the one that's developed by their institute, by their favorite scientist, which is great and important. However, that means that these five studies are very difficult to compare together. How do we know if a positive outcome on this particular section on naming is going to be correlated to another test that looks at naming in a different way. So that's something in the work that we're doing uh, with Dr. Melanie Pleurd at the University of Sherbrooke, looking at all the different tests that we're using and trying to come up with a recommendation for how we can better move the science closer together so that we can figure out what is actually going on in the field. And the last point on this slide here is just study design heterogeneity. So we know that each researcher has a slightly different study design, study type, different dosages. And not to say that we should all be doing the exact same study, but it does help when we're trying to come to a consensus on the benefit in the field if there are some similarities between the scientific research. Okay, so I wanted to share an example of how we've used a database to get a little bit closer look at the field, and I wanted to use dementia as an example today. And so what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is a series of filters that we have in our database, similar to how you're going to customize a search when you're looking at the scientific research. So two options that we have on this page to filter, we look for our outcomes. So the outcome of interest that I've looked for is dementia in this particular example. And we can look for where we're looking for the, the word or the term dementia in the articles. So we might want to look in the results, and that means that the authors or the scientists are measuring dementia in some way. So they're using an assessment tool to measure it, or they're looking at a change in dementia characteristic or outcome. And we see that there's 27 human interventional studies that look at dementia in the results. And we see 74 human interventional studies that use dementia as a participant characteristic. So they include people in the study that have dementia. And at the top, we see that we have different dosage filters. So something that's interesting is to look at a dosage effect. Do we see a greater impact on outcomes related to dementia or other health outcomes based on the dose that we administer? Sometimes we see a, a U-shaped or a opposite of a U-shaped curve, we have an effect in the middle. Sometimes we have an effect at the higher end or the lower end. You don't need that much sometimes to see a benefit. It depends on the health condition. So as you can see here, when we look at the number of studies, we have five studies that use a dose of 250 to 500, and it ranges throughout. So I'm just presenting the numbers here today, but this is kind of the first step to take a deeper dive into the science, because what we can do now is look at those studies and look at the effects that they present and see what we're noticing, if we're noticing a differential effect at certain dosages. We know that's really important for EPA and DHA, so it gives us a sense of how we can take our next step and dive deeper into the science. And in, in the next example here, we wanted to highlight the agents filter that we have. So this allows us to look at other, in, other ingredients that we have in our clinical trials. We know that we're not just consuming EPA and DHA in a silo or just as a single ingredient. And so I was curious what other nutrients we've seen incorporated. So this doesn't explain the totality, but just an example of what we might see. So we have one study that looks at EPA and DHA plus vitamin D. One study that looks at EPA, DHA plus vitamin C, and there's six studies that look at EPA and DHA plus vitamin E. So again, it just gives us a sense if we're going to have an additive or adjunctive therapy, what is the research showing us so far? 
We also know that there's multiple other ways that we can support brain health and cognitive health, and this might be through other therapies like yoga, sudoku, sudoku puzzles, um, group interaction, et cetera. These are also things that we can look for in our clinical trials to see if they have a beneficial effect. So really interesting in the field of mental and cognitive health to look at how other components can support health outcomes. Okay, so in the next section of the presentation, we wanted to talk a little bit about EPA versus DHA. So for anyone who attended our event, the GoAt Exchange in February, some of these slides might be familiar. If we'll say this is one of my most interesting topics, then I guess it will come up again in future presentations. So. Um, Again, just starting to look at the media, this has not been something we've seen much before, but the last few years we're seeing an increased number of articles asking about the difference between these fatty acids. So we're really curious what people are talking about and what the research is saying when we look at the difference between EPA and DHA. So this is one of my favorite images here, I think just to remind us of where we see EPA and DHA occurring. And so in foods, EPA and DHA are always occurring together. So in fish that we eat, they're always going to be occurring together in, in those foods, so in seafood, et cetera, and in the supplements that we might find more commonly. So in fish oil, krill oil, and algal oil, often we're having these two supplements together. This isn't saying that this is happening all the time. We know that we do have some specialized supplements that have only EPA or only DHA. For example, we have some high EPA supplements for cardiovascular disease of some brands that might be familiar to you. And we also have some DHA-only supplements, specifically in infant formula. We see mostly DHA that's high in infant formula. So there are cases where these nutrients are separate um, in our consumption. But generally, they occur together. And we think that's an important point based on the research so far that really shows us um, the totality of evidence is combining these nutrients together. Okay, so just quickly on the health benefits of EPA and DHA. Again, this is not new science, but something that's been evolving over time. And I have an um, image of one of our favorite scientists, Dr. Philip Calder, of whom you may be familiar with. A lot of his research was supporting the initial um, health benefits and health effects of EPA versus DHA. So when we think about these nutrients together, they support a various, various different body systems. So we know that EPA and DHA are important for maintaining healthy triglyceride levels. They're important for supporting our brain health, as we talked about in the previous part of the presentation. They support our health, heart health, so cardiovascular and other heart conditions. Um, promoting eye health, I think this is one of the most uh, robust categories that we see talked about for dry eyes. So even my optometrist and I had a big discussion about EPA, DHA, and eye health the other day. And uh, maintaining a healthy blood pressure. So really important throughout our whole entire body. They make our way into our cell membranes and then make our way throughout our different body systems. As we know, we kind of talk about four main categories the most, and so this is why we're interested in some of the emerging areas, but for the most part, we talk about heart, brain, pregnancy and early childhood development, as well as eye health. So those tend to be the four cornerstones, but we know there's different ways that omegas can work in our body, and we're excited for those areas to develop. So when I'm talking about EPA and DHA, not to say that they're the same. So from a chemical perspective, um, as a biochemical scientist, we know that they have quite different structures. So they look different chemically, so that means that they're probably going to behave slightly differently in our bodies, and that's well understood. So EPA has been shown to be closely associated to some hard cardiovascular endpoints. It's also been shown to be beneficial in mental and clinical benefits, for example, in schizophrenia research as well as an inflammation. So I have in brackets AA, and that represents arachidonic acid because EPA and arachidonic acid directly compete for the same molecule in our body. So they work to reduce inflammation. So really an interesting um, combination between our omega-3 and our omega-6 fatty acids. And on the DHA side of things, again, we talk about DHA a lot in pregnancy and lactation. We find it a lot in prenatal supplements and in infant formula. Really important for early childhood 
growth and brain development, visual and neural function, as well as cognitive function. So they do have some distinct effects, but if I had to choose between brain and heart, I'm not sure I would have an easy choice there. I want to make sure I support all parts of my body, and it would be hard to choose one versus the other. Thank you. Sorry, just making sure I'm on track here for time. Perfect. So we just wanted to provide an example from the clinical trial database. The clinical trial database, um, how we used it to look at our research here. And so we looked at e high EPA, high DHA, and then the combination of the two. And so really what we wanted to see is, is there a reason to really only focus on one or the other? And what I wanted to highlight here was the positivity. So we have very high positivity. So what this means is that the overall abstract conclusions from the authors were rated as quite positive. So we see almost 70% and above for high EPA, high DHA, or studies with or without both. So we're seeing quite good outcomes from both of these fatty acids as studied by themselves. And this is a new area of research. We haven't seen a lot of single ingredients for EPA and DHA yet, so we're interested to see where that research will go in the next few years. So for the last section of the presentation, we wanted to talk about some emerging areas of interest. So we're not going to go deep into the science, really just hoping to um, spark some interest and some conversations about these research areas. And again, I just like to see the, the headlines and the media to get us started. But the first thing we wanted to talk about was sleep and EPA and DHA. So if this image reminds you of your pet at home or I don't know, significant other, depending on the day. Um, we wanted to know what's going on in the sleep research. So when we look at sleep and omega-3s, we see a pretty sharp increase over time between 2010 and 2022 in the number of articles that are talking about sleep and omega-3. And then when we look at clinical trials only, we're still, we basically had no research involving sleep at all before 2010, and now we're seeing a steady increase over time. So really interesting how the field is picking this up, and I think across other nutrients as well. EPA and DHA aren't unique in that way. And in the bottom, we have specific to EPA and DHA. So again, we are not seeing much before 2010, and steadily every year since then, we've had studies looking at sleep and EPA and DHA. And when we look at our clinical study database, we can look into some of the terms that we're seeing being researched. And so we really are considering this as a new area of interest. There's lots of studies that are coming. And we can look at different outcomes. So when you say sleep, does that mean hours of sleep, quality of sleep, um, sleep cycles, sleep hygiene? So there's a lot of different things that we can look at as a measurement point when we consider sleep research and the effect of a supplementation study. So in our database to date, I think that says 17. So a quite a small but growing number of studies related to sleep. The, the next one that we wanted to talk about was exercise and sports recovery. So again, if this reminds you of yourself when you're on the Frisbee field or your pet, um, we just wanted to show this word cloud to represent how many different types of words are associated. When I look at the word exercise, we see tons of different research that involve exercise and other body functions and um, health of our body. But when I look at exercise and sports recovery, specifically myalgia, so muscle soreness, it becomes a lot fewer. So we're looking specifically to look at muscle soreness, and there haven't been that many studies to date that are specifically measuring that. So we wanted to mention this because we find it to be quite a hot topic. Lots of people are very interested in this. They want to know, how can I recover faster, get back to the gym sooner, run further? But there, we don't have a lot of evidence. We have a lot of exercise science research, but in terms of exercise recovery and muscle soreness, it's quite limited. So we're seeing only 10 studies to date that are looking at myalgia specifically. The last one that I wanted to share is related to immune health and EPA and DHA. As we know, we've been uh, thinking about our immune health in a much different way over the last few years. And we wanted to think about immune health in the context of COVID-19, but also beyond COVID-19. So we, it's, it's an interesting thing and extremely relevant to the industry right now to think about that. 
and I wanted to show a few different slides here. And although it's extremely relevant and important, it is extremely difficult to sift through and find the markers and endpoints of interest. What do we search for? Immune system? You're not going to look. Does my immune system change before, after? How are you measuring that? So you want to look at: Is there are there specific um, antigens? Are there specific phagocytes? What molecules in our body are going to give us an indication about what our health is like? So it's very difficult, and not to say that it's not worth trying. It really is, but it just requires a lot of thoughtful conversation and discussion about what we're going to look for and measure in our studies to be able to say something about our nutrient of interest in relation to the immune system. Okay, so in summary, I wanted to encourage all of you here today and listening, as well as at the trade show, to come by our booth at J170 to speak with us in more detail, firstly about GOED, the Global Organization for EPA and DHA, as well as the new GOED Clinical Study Database. I provided some examples of how we've used it, but we're really excited to show you how you might be able to use it and do some demos with you if you come by. Um, we also wanted to talk more about brain health and cognitive health. We know it's really a challenge. We're excited for the new research. If you have ideas, we'd love to talk to you about this. Uh, we also, you know, EPA versus DHA. If you just want to come by and talk about your favorite way to consume these nutrients, we're also happy to have that conversation as well. We love them too. And um, lastly, to talk about, we've just presented three of the emerging areas, but we know there's lots more. So if there's an area that you're talking about with your, um, your company or your colleagues, we're really interested to hear that. So if there's a new area that you want to learn more about or want us to have on our radar, please come by and speak to us and we'd be happy to have that conversation. So that will bring us to some acknowledgements. So just wanted to thank those involved in helping me prepare for this presentation. So our director, executive director, Ellen Shutt, Dr. Aldo Bernasconi, who's our director of sci data science, Dr. Melanie Plourd, who are doing our first systematic review collaboration with, and Heather, who is one of our organizers here at Vita Foods. So thank you again to Vita Foods for the opportunity to present here today, and happy to take some questions. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, for that really interesting presentation. Um, I think we have time for maybe one quick question, and we actually have a couple here online. So somebody's asked, what about claims versus clinical studies? Can you repeat that? <laughs> so what about claims versus clinical studies? What about the claims versus the clinical studies? So I think... In terms of our database, um, we could recommend that this database might be used to help substantiate a claim. We don't have a depository or repository of the claims within the database. So that's where we're hosting the clinical trials. So all of the scientific research is part of our database, which might support putting together a claim. So in terms of all the claims that exist, that's a little bit outside of our database, but we know the science can support making those, making those claims. So hopefully I've addressed that question. Thank you, and one quick question. Is the database open access? Is it open to everyone? Can manufacturers use it? So right now it's not available to everyone, but we have it available to our GoEd membership, some which have a complimentary access, others which have a subscription fee. It is the first database of its kind, and we're really trying to learn what the potential and the use case is for it. So we're really looking for collaborations and partnerships. So right now it is a subscription fee model, but we're curious how this might evolve and change over time as we learn more about how we can best use it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you.